Hi, this is Penn Gillette. This is a CCS podcast. Everything else is fucking bullshit. <laughs> Well, basically, every time we think that we're pulled out of this topic, we're pulled back, you know, in again, straight away. And of course, that topic is feminism and white knight gaming journalism. Recently, there has been a slew of articles that have basically championed the ideas of feminism, championed the ideas of social justice within video games. And uh, recently, I was listening to a podcast by a comedian who I like quite a bit called Matt Lees. Uh, He's been a gaming journalist for a while now, and he's just started a new podcast called Darth Souls, which is quite good and very informative. And uh, they got into the subject of, uh, shall we say, sexual attributes in video games. And he suddenly went on a small sort of tirade with his friends about how it was ridiculous that there should be tits used to advertise uh, mini games that you could buy on the app store. And then they started saying, but it's okay because I've never met anyone who's been paid to give an opinion that doesn't agree with our opinion, which is effectively the liberal slant of... Exactly. And and I instantly took to the comments because I can't help myself. And I gave a long response of, well, I think you need to look at the situation more holistically. The fact that social mobility and the way the love industry works in Japan is the reason why video games are as sexualized as they are out there. The way that a lot of people don't really take it as seriously as you think they do. The discussion that's not being had on whether or not it does affect gamers and whether or not they are just being turned into slavering animals as you think because they buy a game with tits, whether or not they do that at all. The fact that this is all just marketing, we all know that it's just marketing, that it's just being used as an advertising slot. Nobody takes it seriously. And the response I basically got was, oh, I'm not interested in this discussion. Anyone who calls it social justice warrior nonsense is, is just, you know, has a wonky opinion. Uh, I don't believe tits should be in games to sell them. And if you want to unsubscribe to my Patreon, if you're contributing to it, you're more than welcome to. Wow. And after, yeah, I just, what can I do? I posted a small response afterwards that said, that's not really what I was saying, but thank you very much. And I moved on. But I was quite disturbed that there has been this sort of growing trend amongst anyone who is even slightly in sort of the realms of professional reviewership, where they completely and utterly subscribe to exactly what propaganda is being put forward by... Uh, this wall with hook, lion, sinker. Exactly. Being put forward by developers, being put forward by uh, review sites, being put forward by people who have social anxieties that they want to advertise. And I'm just sick of it, really. I don't know why we're still putting up with it. Well, so essentially what you're saying is that there's a hive mind now where yes. people are afraid to really disagree with each other because if there's that disagreement, then their ideas will be called stupid. I mean, that's part of it. It's not even the fact that they don't want to disagree. It's the fact that they don't even want to have the discussion. Exactly. I mean, Jesus Christ, talk about ivory towers. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the Matt Lee's incident, because not too long ago, one of the most recent comments we've received on our White Knight Game Journalism After Hours was some gentleman basically dismissing the entire debate with a snide, oh wow, now that's a 40 minute circle jerk I never want to hear again comment. And albeit there's a good chance that this guy is not listening to this right now, one thing I would like to ask is this. Sir, if two people who more or less agree with one another, imploring their listeners to look at the situation from multiple angles versus letting their biases get the better of them as a circle jerk, then, pardon me, but what words would you use to describe this pantheon of internet demigods who've preemptively decided that theirs is the only way to look at these matters and have absolutely no desire to listen to any dissent? Yeah. Because again, the YouTube guy could have been facetious, you know, he could have been trolling. But, you know, this Matt Lee's fella? That's like the textbook example of everything we've been talking about all this time. It was almost word for word what he said. We're winning. Nobody is paid to have a different opinion. And that, to me, suggests a totalitarian view rather than a, you know, a victory. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's incredibly disappointing to see that people still act that way in that they try and shut each other down instead of having an intelligent discussion. We see that social justice warriors are pretty much the dominant mindset these days, or at least what they believe in is what society itself largely values, you know, so it's just bizarre to see that they try to shut down contrary opinions as if there was no such thing as free speech. It's kind of weird in a way. 
Wouldn't you want to hash ideas out so we could grow as a society? Yep. Right, if, if you believe the truth is on your side, what exactly do you have to be afraid of? Yeah. It's bizarre because years ago we had the incident with Jack Thompson who came out and claimed that games are causing violence in children. The consensus at the end of the day, it was put through many courts, was that video games ultimately don't have a strong effect on our children. Uh, put in a clip of Penn and Teller's bullshit here if you want to. <laughs> Okay, just go ahead and uh, take your finger off the trigger. Would you like to fire off a couple more? No. You don't want to? Exactly, kids are able to distinguish reality and fantasy. However, now the argument has come up that games cause misogyny, and people aren't making the distinction between fantasy and reality. They really do believe that games can affect people now. Which is it, guys? You have to choose a side here. And yeah. what's really disturbing is that we see some people, like Anita Sarkeesian, surprise, surprise, she come up again, championing this movement where, just like Jack Thompson, you sort of see like a very distorted point of view right in trying to present an ideology that only she wants to talk about where you can't really you know contest her ideas or else she's gonna you know ignore you or come after you she'll be dismissive and call you a troll or a misogynist yeah not to mention she's ignoring the context of the stuff that she discusses there's already been uh, comments on the fact that she completely missed out that in Dinosaur Planet it was equally a boy-girl situation and yet only her opinions are propagated in the media for example, in the May 2014 issue of Wired Magazine, there's an article by Laura Hudson called Beat the Devils, Curbing Online Abuse Isn't Impossible, with a four-page article about how companies are attempting to reform verbally abusive gamers through temporary bans and more detailed warning messages. However, on page two of this four-page article, there's Anita Sarkeesian's face taking up the top half of the page, and it's the only photo besides a cover in the entire article. Now about 80% of the article is about measures taken by one of the world's biggest online games, League of Legends. Not to be confused with the League of Angels, our official sponsors. <laughs> oh Gratuitous <my>. panty shots. Approved <laughs> by CCS. <laughs> so I have this entire four-page article. Her contribution is three sentences. But of course she gets the whole page of, of the photo. And her only input in the entire topic is essentially that she's received rape threats on Twitter and that the cops didn't take the threat seriously. However, I know from experience that without evidence and clear and present danger, there's very little a cop can do about internet threats regardless of who's sending them or who's receiving them. But it's like she's going out of her way to bait the trolls and get more attention. What do you say about people who say don't feed the trolls? Um... And it's like, mm. And I mean, look, yeah, we're not saying that anyone deserves that kind of treatment, you know, certainly, like... I think we should also pay attention to what happens when people come forward to the news with the fact that they've been harassed as opposed to the police. We discussed earlier what happened with Dan Slott. Uh, Dan didn't just come forward to the police with the death threats that he received for creating Superior Spider-Man. He also went forward to the news articles to say that I have received death threats for this story. But you know what? He sold a shit ton of comics that day. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so and you know, that's the point that I was trying to make nobody should really receive those kinds of threats But it's what you do with receiving those threats that really differentiates exactly you from being a victim with Anita Sarkeesian or Dan Slott That's just the rule about the internet the minute they show that something can hurt you on the internet Whether you're Dan Slott or whether you're Anita Sarkeesian you're saying oh my god these horrible trolls are you know Offending me. I feel so hurt. I'm getting PTSD <laughs> um, Right you basically signed a fucking death warrant for yourself on the internet. You've let the trolls know that they can get under your skin, they can hurt you, and they are going to just come in full fucking force. Right, because it all comes yeah. down to that internet anonymity equation that Penny Arcade came up with many, many eons ago. But to go back to the Wired Magazine article you mentioned, uh, you do realize why Anita's face was plastered on the second page of the article. It's because at this point, people like Anita, Sue Park, Rebecca Watson, they're, they're no longer people. They're brands. They're... I'm gonna coin it right now, hashtag Messiah. Nicely done. Yeah, that's what they basically are. <laughs> and the worst thing is the fact that not only can you not have a meaningful debate with these people, because that's not really what they're interested in. Explain. I just told you I went and act that labor. Okay, thanks for being with us, Zoe. But we can't even have a constructive discussion amongst ourselves because people keep bringing them into the conversation as though their personal opinions in the matter deserve some special recognition. But speaking about professional victims, if you still have any doubts about the veracity of what we're talking about when we mention professional victimhood, look no further than our good friend, 
Adam Orth. <laughs> wow, ancient history for the internet, Max. <laughs> it's actually not ancient history because just a couple of months ago, in March 2014, <laughs> Adam Orth was invited to a game developers conference to hold a speech about the toxicity <laughs> and the hostility and the sleaziness of the gaming community. Which he contributed to. Oh, what can I say? TEDx, the poor man's Gettysburg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, let's look at the situation holistically here. Adam Orth trashes his own consumers on Twitter at an inappropriate time for his company, right? Because there were all these tensions going on about whether or not Xbox One would be always online, about its price, and you know what? People were actually considering boycotting the console because of this. And here comes good old Adam Orth with a couple of questionable jokes where he basically mocks a large portion of his consumers and acts like a pompous douche, right? loses his job, which I'm actually gonna go on record and say that I don't believe he should have lost his job. I think a, like a formal apology or something would have sufficed because, you know, I don't think Twitter shenanigans should really cost anyone their professional career, but... Well, yeah. Well, there was Adria Richard, so... I don't know. <laughs> Here's the thing. After all of this, instead of making a mental note that perhaps it's not wise to bite the hand that feeds, i.e. your own consumers, he instead thinks to himself, wait a minute, it's not me or my questionable sense of humor that's at fault here. It's the gamers! Oh my god, that's right! <laughs> it's the gamers! It's the vile and the misogynistic and the vulgar. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> it's so queer to me now! It's the people who pay me! <laughs> yes, and now he's gonna go and try to make a professional career. I stress this, career. Oh god, it's a supervillain <sighs> origin story. <laughs> Out of talking about how horrendous, you know, the gaming community is. And again, I don't believe that Microsoft should have fired the guy in the first place. But after this, let's just say I wouldn't buy the guy a drink and listen to his sub story if I met him in real life. <laughs> what you do is you buy a shot 151, throw it on, and light a match. <laughs> 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 Whoops, did I say that? It's amazing that people believe in the whole toxicity of gaming thing. I think it's just to get attention, to be honest. I mean, he wants to stay relevant, he wants to ride the hype train, and it's just exactly what David Ellis did. Yes. A developer of the Halo series said, quote, The industry is full of man babies in relation to Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid V character Quiet and her skimpy ass attire. Meanwhile... Meanwhile, that guy is working on a fucking game series that one of the main characters is a naked blue digital woman named Cortana. <laughs> And of course this ignores the previous context of the fact that in the first Metal Gear, uh, the character, the male character, Snake, is naked from the waist up and is and being, being tortured, tortured just in like the same way. Be. Yep, and in, and in the second game, Raiden, who is completely naked, is being tortured in the exact same way. And you get to play as him completely naked. Uh, holding his balls, running around. Exactly. Buck ass naked. Holding onto his crotch and doing lots of flips. <laughs> um, <laughs> lots of cartwheels. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's bizarre that people are so good at forgetting all this shit, you know, that they clearly haven't played the games. They are just looking to jump onto the bandwagon. But William, who cares about context? Here's a pair of digital breasts. Get incensed. <laughs> what, you're not offended by this? What, what the fuck is wrong with you, you myopic rape apologist? <laughs> <laughs> you, I just... I just find it. Here's the thing. With all of these gaming websites, it's almost like they have this bizarre ritual that whenever there's a slow news day or some controversy breaks out, they always have an article or two dedicated to the toxicity of the gaming community that they're ready to dish out, even if it's entirely unwarranted. And yet, when you look at all of these articles, oftentimes, it's these journalists themselves who are being hostile and even sometimes abusive to their own readership. Ah, exactly. I mean, seriously, most of these journalists at this point, they're kind of like the drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket, you know? Yeah. It's like, attention, you worthless syscom! <laughs> Today I'm gonna tell you about why Dragon's Crown or Quiet from MGS5 is a terrible example of the abuse and the objectification that's going on in the gaming industry. You magnificent bastards, you should read my book! <laughs> <laughs> I was flipping through Reason Magazine and something it pointed out that no one else seems to want to talk about in regards to these nefarious female fantasy armor fetishizing MMOs is that there's actually some interesting research being done that says perhaps they're contributing more towards actual gender equality than most people would want to give them credit for. 
Nick Yee, a researcher at Ubisoft, ran some studies that suggest that men are more likely to gender swap in MMO games. I mean, after all, if you're going to be staring at an ass for 40 hours, it might as well be a good-looking one. <laughs> That's exactly what my housemate said to me last year. <laughs> but uh, seriously, while these gamers are playing as scantily clad night elves or whatever, they may experience harassment between the creepy and the chauvinistic firsthand. They might get followed around by other players gawking at their digital TNA, <laughs> or at frustration they'll call you a bitch, or you may get catcalls and get hit on. Video games are about virtual experiences, and here you get to experience the shoe on the other foot, so to speak, which may lead a guy to rethink his approach when it comes to real life females. Yeah, what this should show is that games are far less predictable than the uh, media outlets would like you to believe at the moment. People talk about games- Or the social justice warriors. Yeah, exactly. Social justice warriors, they talk about games and gaming as if it's all one big conglomerate, you know, ignoring the fact that each game is unique, that, you know, that we don't actually look at games based on their social content, we look at games based on are they any good or not. I do believe that there is genuine social justice that needs to be applied in this world, but when I use the term social justice warrior, it's normally in a sarcastic sense towards people who are looking for um, sort of middle class problems. Attention. Yeah, exactly. Genuine issues of race, genuine issues of, uh, you know, misogyny, they do exist. But I think anyone with half a brain cell knows that these are problems. I think the problem is people are looking for it everywhere now. Swing on your brother. If you could say, Hi, I'm Pendulette, this is the CC.